this is a very unusual event because throughout Canada, the anti-war movement is dead. And uh, I'm particularly indebted to the mobilization against war and occupation for the opportunity to be with you this, this evening. I must say I was in Winnipeg and it was minus 27 degrees, so I would have come, done anything to come to Vancouver. <laughs> but, and, uh, but people, in, I, I, with all due respects, because the Manitobans at 27 degrees below zero, they came to the event. You know? <laughs> there were less people than, than tonight, but still. So we must give them credit. For sure. <laughs> and um, uh, this is a very difficult issue to address because here we have a country which in the course of three years of US-led war lost 30% of its population. And that is what the documentary, this is one segment of an American documentary. Uh, the, every single city was destroyed. And uh, after having destroyed 78 cities and thousands of villages, General Curtis LeMay, and this is of course a very famous quote, remarked, and I can't imitate his accent, unfortunately. Over a period of three years or so, we killed off, what, 20% of the population, unquote. Now, the fact that they would actually admit that they committed extensive war crimes against this country in Northeast Asia uh, is revealing, but they applaud these war crimes. Not only do they applaud them, but at the same time, they will not acknowledge the fact that they actually occurred. Okay? And there's not a single family in North Korea, or, or even in South Korea, which hasn't lost a loved one during that war. And that is something which we have to address. There's no other country in world history, to my knowledge, that has lost 30% of its population in a conventional war. I mean, there are countries that lost more than 3 million people, including the Soviet Union, including Germany, Yugoslavia during, but of course they had much larger populations. And, uh, but here we have to address the history of that war. And we also have to address the armistice agreement which was signed in 1953, uh, which, which was an armistice agreement, it's not a peace agreement, which means from a from a legal point of view, the parties are, st are still at war. <coughs> and that's very important. Now, let me say a few words about Christian Freeland. I, uh, this is not an exercise in diplomacy. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, she gets a C plus in diplomacy. Well, maybe less than that, but I'm, uh, on the whole, I'm, 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 I'm a soft grader at, at the university. But the, the fact that she would present this as a diplomatic initiative is an absolute scandal. Because the countries which were invited are, all the, are only the countries which participated in the military operation, which resulted in, this, in these crimes against humanity. 
And they don't, these governments do not represent the people of those countries, Greece, Belgium, Holland, Colombia. And so as far as international diplomacy, Christian Freeland gives a very poor impression. It's a copy and paste of US foreign policy. But there's another element. Uh, both Freeland and her U.S. counterparts don't seem to have an understanding of history uh, because the Armistice Agreement was signed by three countries, which are the DPRK, China, and the United States. Now, any kind of diplomatic initiative on the part of the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs would have had to at least invite the parties involved in, the, in, those, uh, in that armistice agreement of 1953. Uh, the United States has systematically refused to enter into peace negotiations. We know that. And it has threatened North Korea, as well as China, for 67 years with nuclear. Well, specifically, North Korea has been threatened with nuclear war for 67 years, starting prior to the Korean War in early 1950. And we have to address the, the history of nuclear weapons. The United States of America has 900 times more bombs than North Korea. But that's not the only important element. Belgium and Holland have five times more bombs, nuclear bombs, than North Korea. And they are de jure, from a legal point of view, both Belgium and Holland are nuclear weapon states. They are under national command. They are made in America. They're B-6111 tactical nuclear weapons with an explosive capacity between one-third and six times a Hiroshima bomb. Turkey has five times more bombs than North Korea. Is that a matter of concern? And they're targeted against countries in the Middle East. And they are under national command. I can go on, but the, the, the issue is uh, that the United States wants to ensure a monopoly over weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and they, to, to achieve this objective, they wish to, I, I mean, we can make a case for against nuclear weapons in the case of North Korea. That is their choice. And they didn't make that choice immediately. It took them a long time before they actually took that decision. And that decision was carefully, um, was carefully analyzed. It was based on, the, on, the, on the, the notion of deterrence, that, it, that to protect yourself, you have to be, you have, you have to be able to respond. And uh, that concept of deterrence goes back to the Cold War era. Uh, yet, today, we are in a very different environment because the concepts of the Cold War era have been scrapped with regard to nuclear weapons. There was an understanding during the Cold War that nuclear weapons were the weapons of last resort. Uh, they weren't meant to be used because uh, both uh, Russia and both the Soviet Union and the United States understood that this would lead to nuclear annihilation. And it was called mutually assured destruction, MAD. Now, we have gone from MAD to um, madness and insanity. Uh, in other words, it's mutually assured destruction was a concept which indicated a certain security. Uh, and 
the diplomatic channels were open. Now, if we start to compare the situation which prevailed in October 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had a situation where both John F. Kennedy on the one hand and Nikolai Sergeyevich Khrushchev understood, <coughs> both leaders understood what the consequences would be. And they also communicated. They, they had the red telephone, okay? That was before the handheld. They had, they had, they debated, they discussed, and they did everything to avoid the unthinkable. Now bear in mind that the unthinkable could very well be the result of a miscalculation, of a mistake. And those mistakes are even more, uh, you know, the risk of mistake is, is even more uh, so when you have a lack of political understanding at the diplomatic level. So our leaders today, uh, first of all, I should say, don't have the foggiest idea of the consequences of nuclear weapons. And I'll explain that because the nuclear weapons doctrine has changed. Um, and they, but on the other hand, they're prepared, Donald Trump is prepared to use them, fire and fury. And, uh, and I would suspect that Christian Freeland, uh, where, she, where we could give her an A plus, is for fire and fury, copy and paste. Okay, she, she, is a, she has endorsed that doctrine by providing ultimately an unequivocal support of Canada to, uh, to the US uh, military agenda of first strike nuclear warfare. There's a problem. Sort of the mic. Just talk closer to this mic. This mic here? Yeah. Do people hear me at the back? Is that, is that all right? The one in the back in that. So if you get closer to that mic, they might be able to hear you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> OK. Um, I very often, I never teach with mics. So it's, that's uh, an idiosyncrasy. Now, so, so compare. What I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting here is that we are at a very dangerous crossroads in world history. Um, there are enough nuclear bombs to blow up the planet several times. Okay? Um, the nuclear doctrine from the Cold War era to the present was changed dramatically in the year 2001, following the 9-11 attacks. And they were, what now prevails is the notion of first strike preemptive nuclear war. And what that means is that you, uh, you scrap the concept of mutually assured destruction of deterrence and you replace it by a notion that you will use nuclear weapons on a first strike basis against countries you don't like, okay? They might be shitholes or whatever, to <laughs> quote. I'm sorry to use that, but that, I'm quoting Trump, okay? So that, but I, I'm not, uh, this is no joke. It, it is, it's what they then engage in is presenting the first strike doctrine, which was formulated in 2001, approved by the Senate in 2002, uh, as a means of self-defense, OK? So we're going, to, we're going to have a first strike against certain countries we don't like and who are a threat to our security. I can tell you which ones are, involved, are, are included in there. It's, it's Russia, China. Iran and North Korea. There are others as well. But it's worth noting, and I'm giving a parenthesis, that war games conducted in, in 2007, or military scenarios, included 
It was a scenario of World War III, so we're not joking. They run scenarios of World War III every year. Now, I got my hands on a declassified version which was leaked to the Washington Post, and it's four fictitious countries which are called Churia, Rubek, Nemesi, and Birmingham. <laughs> you can guess that's Churia, China, Rubek, Russia, uh, Nemesi, North Korea, Birmingham, Iran. Okay? <laughs> now, it's, it's interesting that these four countries are ultimately the targets of US foreign policy. Russophobia, cutting of diplomatic relation, of uh, diplomatic communication with Russia, accusing them of intervening in elections, and so on and so forth. Um, the t pivot to Asia with regard to China, the threats directed against Iran, and so on, including the use of so-called tactical nuclear weapons. 